Aloha, we're here in Honolulu, Hawaii for the Plant Biology 17 Annual Conference. I'm your host, Risha Masalia, and we're Between the Palms. Hello and welcome to another episode of Between the Palms. Today I'm joined by Jose. Jose, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your research? So uh, we're very much interested in understanding how plants interact with their environments. Okay. And I think one of the most important environmental stimuli that plants have to uh, sense and respond to is the availability of water. Yes. So we focus on uh, understanding this process both under non-stressful conditions, so okay. how does the plant uh, see and sense the distribution of water in soil, okay. um, how, how do plants respond to uh, stressful environmental conditions where water is limiting, okay. and then uh, how do plants sense a variation in the amount of salinity, which okay. can often uh, occur with drought and also uh, exacerbate some of the effects of drought. Right. So, uh, one of the questions I love to ask uh, plant scientists is, what are your origin stories? How did you get involved in plants? Was there anything in your childhood that said, ah, I'm going to study plants as a, as a future, as an adult? Um, as a child, I wanted to ride with dolphins. Okay, <laughs> that <laughs> aligns with plants 100%, yeah, right? right. <laughs> uh, it was, you know, watching uh, PBS documentaries, okay. uh, Jacques Cousteau, you know, seeing sort of the, the beauty and the wonder yes. of the natural so world. So Jose Denny, marine biologist. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, so uh, at some point, um, I became interested in more molecular scale processes as okay. I took uh, chemistry and physics. And when I came to Berkeley, um, I started in uh, molecular and cell biology. Okay. Um, so I thought that's the area that I wanted to get into. But um, if anyone's been in a molecular cell biology major, most of the people in there are pre-meds. Yes. And so I was uh, taken aback to some extent because I thought, well, I'll get to go to Berkeley and everyone's going to be passionate about biology. <laughs> Not everyone was passionate about biology. So I started looking around to other majors mm -hmm. at the university and um, the uh, plant biology major yeah. at, at Berkeley was really great because it allowed for a more holistic understanding of the organism. Okay. So I took courses in plant morphology, uh, plant systematics, evolution, uh, biochemistry, physiology, right. and so forth. So I think at the end of that education, I really had this really um, deep and broad understanding of plants that has really served me well uh, you, throughout my career. Do you think that uh, the reason that is is because um, when people are interested in, in pre-med, so I was a, I was a pre-med uh, mm. student as well, and then I eventually transitioned over to the wonderful world of plants. Um, but when I was in pre-med classes, uh, we had an end goal, right? We were gonna go to med school, and you have a very focused uh, career at the end of that. Yes. But when you study plants, and you go to graduate school, you work in industry or, or whatever, your career path is very open-ended. So it do you think that, that contributes to the idea of, of studying you know, more holistic whole organism? I see. Well, I, I think there's a, maybe a, a more classic view of education that it needs to be broad in order to allow you to tackle any question that you can't, right? So, right. I mean, I think in, 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 in sort of the simplest sense, the university should should train you in how to ask and answer questions mm -hmm. and, and guide your own discovery, right? Yes. After, after taking coursework in, as an undergraduate, you shouldn't need to have a course format to be able to educate yourself in a particular right. area. You, you get that to... training as an undergraduate. Yes, so that... exactly. Um, and so I think the, the faculty at, at, at Berkeley had, in the plant biology department, mm -hmm. had that sort of uh, appreciation for how the educational pro right. process right. should work. Um, and, and so for, for, for me, that worked well. Um, and it, to some extent, uh, some of the pressures I feel right now in terms of yeah. having had a lab for uh, almost 10 years, I can feel myself sort of getting more narrow in, in my own understanding. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm interested now in ways of, of broadening my Broad education as well. Yeah. 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 And I think part of that will include uh, more teaching because I think through teaching, yeah. uh, one has to have that broader context in order to communicate not just the, the narrow uh, focus of what one's own research is, but right. how that fits within a broader context. Right, the perspective that you gain, yeah, okay. So you had mentioned in your research that you study uh, below ground or roots, mm -hmm. right, how they interact with the soil and how they uptake water. 
Um, why roots? I, I also uh, study a little bit of roots and I work on water uh, limitation uh, in my own thesis work. You ask yourself why. And I, I ask myself why. You know, I get up in the morning and I'm like, I gotta go harvest some roots. <laughs> this is gonna be terrible. Uh, when you know you have the above ground, you have the leaves and you have the stems, and you have the reproductive uh, plants that are all above ground. You don't have to dig or use shovels. Yes. And you can see them. Yes. So why roots? So I started off uh, during my graduate work studying uh, fruit, uh, flower development, lateral organ development. So everything okay. above everything, above, yeah. above ground. Okay. And so you started started. Easy. I started I started off well. So <laughs> what 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 becomes complicated? Yeah. What becomes complicated is that the the development of these above ground organs mm -hmm. um, is actually uh, more difficult to track in a spatial temporal way. So if you want to look at um, how tissues differentiate. Uh, if you want to understand these different processes, it's somewhat difficult to study uh, um, using sort of uh, spatiotemporal analysis of the process. In a root, so one of the things that Philip Benfi, who was my postdoctoral advisor, um, often um, uh, states is one of the benefits of studying roots is mm -hmm. that all the developmental stages of a root are present within any one organ. Right? Okay. So if you want to study uh, so when I was uh, finishing up my graduate work and moving yeah. on to my postdoc, right. one of the key questions I wanted to ask was, um, what are the pathways and the processes that allow a cell to go from, uh, say, a specified state where a transcription factor may say, okay, you are going to be this particular identity, mm -hmm. to an actual functional state where that right. cell is now performing a unique function important for the plant, okay. right? And the root is perfect for that, right? right? Because you have clear, um, uh, files of cells mm -hmm. that have different identities. You can track the identity or the development of those cells across a single organ. And each of these cell types has a clear, uh, different, uh, clear and defined func physiological function that helps the plant um, uh, access nutrients, uh, filter these nutrients, right. transport them to the shoot. So in, while um, in some cases it's uh, more difficult to study, uh, at least when I entered into the field, yeah. For the questions that I, I wanted to address, it was in some ways the perfect System, organ. Yeah, okay. Now, I think the complications, and actually, I think actually some of the really fascinating aspects of, of root biology come when you start to take this sort of isolated system and place it back into its natural environment. Uh, yes. and so that, go out of the lab and go. Well, into the field, or yeah. or even you know. So I started off uh, studying uh, salt stress. Okay. Because I thought that was an easy stress <laughs> <laughs> to study, right? We, you just we, we've you, had similar discussions <laughs> in our own lab, so yeah. 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 You just add salt to the media, yeah, and you know how much salt you add. Yes. Right? You don't need to really yeah. measure anything else beyond that. Yep. So I thought I thought it was very simple. Um, it's not. It's very complicated. But as we've started to um, our, our our own selves rediscover this complexity, yeah we're introduced to new questions right. that we can then start um, expanding our work into. Right. Um, and so I think it's actually uh, one of the frontier areas is to um, take some of the approaches that we have in terms of studying uh, root biology at the, the cellular and tissue scale mm -hmm. and, and moving those into more natural or realistic environments right. to, to understand how, you know, if you change the concentration of salt, you're not just changing the concentration of salt. You're affecting uh, mineral well, nutrition. Yeah, exactly. You're affecting uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the deposition of salt is going to change over time, the transpiration right. and various other things. Right. Um, so uh, that's something that we're currently trying to pursue and develop methods for, for studying that. Yeah, we've had something similar when we stutter, study uh, water limitation. So when I became a graduate student, I naively thought, OK, if I want to study drought, the, the easiest thing to do is you have a plant as a control that uh, you water, and then you have another plant that you don't water. You know, I do this in my house with my own house plants, and I see them struggle. And I think, oh, I'll translate this to a lab, and it'll be, it'll be simple. And then I actually start studying this as a graduate student. It's not simple at all. Yes. Right? There's so much complexity to how you study an abiotic stress and, or an environmental stress and how it interacts with not only the plant itself, but also the environment around it. One of the things I've, I've been looking into recently myself is uh, the lack of water and its relationship to nutrient uptake, mm -hmm. right? Because some, some nutrients require water to, to actually get to the plant. And if you have a drought, then you also might have low nutrient availability. Yes. And um, for salt, it's the same thing. You might have, if you have more water 
and the same amount of salt, then you have a less diluted concentration mm -hmm. of salt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these things interplay. And I find that complexity to be just fascinating, but also really hard to study in a lab setting. Yes. But to actually translate it back to something that you said, more realistic, we mm -hmm. have to actually start looking at these interactions, yes. right? Um, so what do you think is the next big thing in, a, in environmental stress? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it uh, a better understanding of root physiology? Um, or is it you know, more realistic environmental stresses in a lab setting? Is it taking the lab setting and going to a field? In your opinion, what do you think is the next mm -hmm. big thing? I think um, uh, under, uh, sensor development, basically. Okay. So I think there are, are two sides of the interaction right, between the plant and the environment. Right. And we need to understand um, what is it about the environment that's actually changing? Mm -hmm. And to do that, we need to be able to uh, image, quantify, uh, detect changes in that environment. Right? Right. So the development of, of microsensor technology, um, some of the micro CT work that people are doing, sort of scanning soil volumes to understand how, how you know, what's the influence of soil wetting properties, of porosity, right. these things. Um, so understanding that, that environmental inter interface is important, especially as we go beyond uh, very simplified environments like agar mm -hmm. to yeah. um, uh, you know to, to to more complicated materials that might have differences in ion exchange capacity and so forth, right? right? And microbiome, right? Yeah, so exactly. um, it, it really understanding that environment and mm -hmm. how it's changing is is key, and that will involve you know uh, interactions with. Uh, soil scientists, engineers, um, material researchers, and so forth. So I think that will be exciting. The other side is uh, how are those environmental um, stimuli mm -hmm. uh, affecting the root? Uh, we really, beyond um, sort of transcriptional profiling, we don't have a very a lot of good tools for looking at the physiological state of cells during environmental responses in real time. Right. So uh, right. developing uh, FRET sensor technologies that mm -hmm. allow us to uh, visualize how, say, water content of cells is changing, movement of water, uh, hormone signaling, right. again, in, 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 at high spatial and temporal resolution. Right, I was going to, yeah, okay. So the just understanding what's yeah. happening, yeah. I think will then, one, often basic observation mm -hmm. reveals new phenomena right. that are occurring in the system. So right. the more we're able to see, uh, the more, uh, the, the, the uh, better more. questions we're going to be able and to And is ask. that just a byproduct of, like, the technology that we're using? Well, a lot what of technology has been focused on, I would say, two aspects. Um, so certainly sequencing proteomics, metabolomics, right. uh, gives you a lot of uh, throughput mm -hmm. in terms of the information that you have. But you still need that biological insight. Right? Right. And phenomics mm -hmm. has led to, again, a lot of data being generated. Mm -hmm. But I you think- to be able to understand what the data is going to be. Well, it, are the things that we're measuring, uh, complex outputs of many different processes. Uh, and so ultimately, they're not going to be able to tell us with any clear insight um, the biological processes that are actually changing. Right. right? So I think um, I was very excited when phenotyping became um, in vogue, mm -hmm. because as a developmental biologist, I, I really appreciate uh, being able to study and understand uh, how developmental processes lead to the forms and functions that we observe. Right. Um, but if the phenotyping is at such a coarse scale that uh, really the developmental phenomena that lead to these uh, attributes like height and, and you know, leaf angles and things like that, if those right. are not considered, I think the analysis and the data that we're going to get is ultimately, ultimately going to be unsatisfying. That makes sense. All right, I think we're gonna we're gonna call it there. This has been another episode of Between the Ponds. Thank you again so much for being here. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next time.